people don't need an extra introduction for him, but for those who are not part of the school, uh, Anders is now a professor of physics at Boston University, and he's extremely well known in the field because he has made fundamental contributions for uh, the studies of uh, simulations in strongly correlated systems. And uh, today he'll be talking about a particularly interesting thing, deconfined quantum criticality. And basically he invented the Ising model for such kinds of non-trivial phase transitions, right? So without further ado, let's go over and hear the colloquium. So over to you. So thank you very much for the introduction. And thanks again to the organizers of the school for inviting me. And I'm very pleased to give the colloquium here today. I've really enjoyed uh, this week in, uh, in Chennai, first time in Chennai. So indeed, I, uh, I think this is a bit loud. Let me, maybe it can be turned down a little bit. Uh, anyway, I, I will um, indeed talk about the confined corner criticality. And uh, some of uh, you know, this material has already been presented in, in uh, the school. So you may, uh, those of you who attended my lectures have seen some of this before, but not everything. So, so I was sort of giving it an introduction you know, during the school lectures to what I'm going to talk about here today, but there is some overlap in the material as well. So what I'm going to discuss basically is uh, you know, 2D uh, quantum antiferromagnets, uh, you know, models of, of, of such things. Uh, and I will discuss uh, you know, the way these can uh, order and uh, you know, what kind of phase transitions we will ha can have. Well, actually, I will focus on you know, two types of order and the, the quantum phase transition between them. So I will discuss how we can go from uh, this familiar Nell antiferromagnet to a dimerized uh, state, where these, these uh, ovals here correspond to, to singlets. Uh, so I will talk about quantum Monte Carlo simulations of models within which we can study uh, these things. And uh, the thing I would like to you know, really get to is the fact that uh, this is a kind of unusual phase transition. Uh, and one of the unusual things is that there are two divergent length scales. Normally, uh, at phase transitions, we have one divergent length scales. Here, uh, we have two length scales. And uh, what we have found uh, recently is that there's some uh, unexpected consequences of, of the fact that we have two length scales. OK. So uh, you know, we are all familiar with, with uh, phase transitions. And those who have, uh, are in this field are, are, are of course, course uh, also familiar with quantum phase transitions. So the point is that we have some uh, mechanism that causes fluctuations in the system. So in the standard case of, of uh, classical phase transitions, it's the temperature that causes the system to fluctuate, and then when we reduce the temperature, the fluctuations are reduced, and eventually we can have uh, a phase transition. And in a quantum system, at zero temperature, although we don't have any thermal transitions, we can have uh, quantum phase transition, uh, sorry, quantum fluctuations. And in a similar way, uh, we can regulate those, but now by some parameter in the Hamiltonian, and we can get transitions between uh, uh, different kinds of phases, as illustrated here. And we can have, uh, in both cases, continuous transitions and, and uh, uh, first order or dis discontinuous transitions. So at the first uh, order transitions, uh, transition, we don't have a, a divergent correlation length. The correlation length may grow as we, we go lower in temperature or as we change this parameter. But then it stays finite, and there's a jump in the order parameter. Whereas in the continuous case, the correlation length is divergent uh, at, uh, at the critical point. Uh, OK. So in this talk, I will focus on uh, continuous transitions in, in 2D quantum antiferromagnets. OK. So the kind of models I have in mind here, uh, they will start from the Heisenberg model. So in general, in the Heisenberg model, if we have uh, restrict ourselves to to some lattice and we have uh, nearest neighbor interactions, we could still have, in, in principle, more uh, than one coupling. So uh, for example, we could have uh, these situations where we have 
uh, two different couplings and we have uh, uh, used those to, to dimerize the system. So if you think of these red bonds here as, as stronger interactions, you know, larger values of, of this J, then you can imagine that, uh, uh, you know, there will be some tendency to forming singlets at, uh, at those red bonds. Uh, and so this would be the way to tune uh, the strength of the quantum fluctuations by, by changing this, this ratio. So you can think of the singlets as, as having large quantum fluctuations if you think in the basis of, of the individual spins. If they are in singlets, they fluctuate a lot, right? And if, uh, if, if uh, we are in an antiferromagnetic state, they, they fluctuate less. So we have this kind of uh, uh, scenario uh, that when we change this G, we go from an ordered antiferromagnetic state and then at some point the order parameter, uh, the sublattice magnetization goes to zero uh, and on this other side uh, a gap opens up and eventually for large G uh, the, the ground state is just a, a singlet product state. But of course this is an approximation as we get close to GC where we get a lot of fluctuations. Okay, uh, so just by symmetry you can guess and it's uh, actually confirmed uh, many times that this phase transition is in the universality class of the three-dimensional uh, Heisenberg model or it's, it's the 3D03 universality class. Okay, so this is a, a rather, it's a, an interesting uh, Thing, but it's a rather boring uh, state that we uh, go into there. <clears throat> well, I shouldn't say it's boring because there are even some experiments. Uh, so let me, before I turn to what I consider more exciting, let me actually mention that uh, this transition has a, an experimental uh, realization in this uh, compound, thallium copper chloride, which uh, consists of a network of dimers of uh, copper atoms. So the copper atoms have unpaired spin one halves and the couplings are pretty strong between those two copper sites. So you can think of, of this as the unit where singlets can form. And then, you know, there are, these dimers are coupled to each other through uh, several interaction paths here. <clears throat> so the, the point here in, in the experiment is that one can actually uh, drive this through uh, a quantum phase transition. Okay, you can also study classical phase transitions, but in particular, if you go to low temperature and change the pressure, you can, uh, in some way, weaken the interactions that cause this singlet formation, so you can get into uh, an ordered nail state. Uh, and there has been a lot of work on, on, on this compound and I think it's the only example of uh, really a, a, an antiferromagnet that can be tuned uh, in a very nice way through this kind of uh, phase transition. <clears throat> but as I mentioned, I want to discuss something you know, more exotic today. So uh, these dimerized systems, they have uh, two spins per unit cell and that's why we can get this uh, uh, singlet formation as, as the driving mechanism uh, to this non-magnetic state. Uh, but now let's look at, at cases where we only have one spin per unit cell, so we can still think of the square lattice here, but we don't uh, put uh, uh, different couplings. We always have the same coupling on each bond, but then we introduce some other interaction, and those interactions should also have um, uh, the, all the symmetries of the square lattice, okay? <clears throat> so then we can get some more exotic states. Uh, well, we can also get exotic states in, in the other case, but, but let's look at, at the situation where we have one, one spin per unit cell. Uh, so we can get what's called spin liquid states, and there has been a lot of discussion about spin liquids in, in this school. Uh, and we can also get valence bond solid or valence bond crystal states. So these kinds of states, uh, it's useful again to, to uh, describe them in terms of singlets. So the spin liquid or, or the RVB is in some generic sense uh, a superposition of uh, many configurations with short uh, singlets. So in this case only uh, nearest neighbor singlets. <coughs> and uh, they, they are really uh, 
uh, you, you can think of them as, as forming a liquid, so they are not uh, uh, strongly correlated to each other. But you can also have situations where these singlets, because of some residual interactions between them, they would like to, to line up and form some pattern. So in the simplest case, uh, you can uh, imagine that they can form uh, some columnar pattern. Okay? <clears throat> so by, by tuning this coupling G, we could go from uh, the simple antiferromagnetic nail state into you know, one of these uh, kinds of states. And then we can ask what kind of, uh, well, we can ask what kind of states we get and what the properties of those states are. And we can ask about the nature of the quantum phase transitions. Okay? <clears throat> so this valence bond basis, you know, if I just include uh, short bonds, it's, it's, it's not a complete basis, but in principle, if we include longer bonds, it really becomes a, a, a complete, even over complete uh, basis uh, of the singlet sector. So we can really uh, describe uh, any singlet state we like in, in this, this basis. Okay, so today I will focus really on, on the, this kind of VBS states and the phase transition from the nail state into that state. Uh, and it turns out that, uh, as I will discuss uh, momentarily, this kind of phase transition may be beyond the standard uh, landau ginzburg wilson paradigm for phase transitions. So that, that's the, this topic of deconfined criticality. So this has a pretty long history, but I think this, this term, deconfined quantum criticality, was introduced in this paper, which is, you know, 13 years uh, ago by now, so it, it may seem <coughs> like a long time, but there are still you know, controversies uh, uh, surrounding uh, uh, this topic. Uh, but it goes even further back, but, but basically the argument was, was made in this particular paper that uh, this transition between the antiferromagnet and the valence bond solid should be generically continuous, okay? And that's <coughs> unusual because that would violate uh, one of the Landau rules, so-called Landau, Landau rules, uh, the one that tells us that if we have a transition, a direct transition between two ordered states, uh, and those two ordered states uh, break unrelated symmetries, then uh, generically such a transition should be first order, okay? But here it was proposed that uh, it should be, be continuous. <clears throat> so that was um, uh, based on um, some insights and some field theory proposals, uh, which I will not uh, you know, discuss in great detail. But uh, the point is that uh, when we write down a field theory, in principle we can have, a, we always would have some uh, possibility of topological defects in, in the field configurations. As illustrated here, this would be what's called a, a hedgehog defect. <clears throat> and those defects can, uh, in principle, play an important role uh, uh, at a phase transition. So a phase transition can be caused by the proliferation of topological defects, for example. Um, so in, in such a case, of course, it would be important then that we, we have those topological defects. <clears throat> now, in, in this case, what, what uh, these authors proposed uh, was that uh, the topological defects, uh, when you go from the VBS into the antiferromagnet, would be uh, uh, what's called dangerously irrelevant. And I will talk more about what that actually means in a while. <clears throat> but basically, it means that at the phase transition itself, the topological defects will play no role uh, as far as uh, the universality class of the transition is concerned. <clears throat> Whereas if you have a, uh, one of these other transitions that I talked about before, topological defects are actually essential. So, so the difference would be uh, that uh, this transition can be described without uh, considering topological defects. <clears throat> and the other, and maybe in some sense more uh, 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 dramatic aspect here is that uh, we should not even 
think about the antiferromagnetic and VBS order parameters as separate things that because they both emerge from some more uh, basic object and those <coughs> objects in the field theory uh, uh, correspond to these uh, spin-on fields. So I will not really uh, you know, de describe exactly what that is, but the point is that we should not write down uh, a Landau theory with two order parameters, but we should consider a case where those two order parameters emerge from another object as we go to the right or, or to the left here. <clears throat> okay, so it turns out that this dangerously irrelevant perturbation, which in this case has to do with topological defects, uh, that also causes there to be uh, an additional length scale in the system. Uh, and that's what I want to discuss uh, first. Uh, and then I want to discuss what uh, are the actual uh, consequences of the fact uh, that we have two divergent length scales here, okay? So, uh, <clears throat> uh, let me model. So, in, in a clock model, it's like, uh, like an XY model, so you have some vector spins in, in the plane, uh, but these spins can only point in a certain uh, number of directions, equally spaced. <clears throat> so in this case here, it would be six different directions, okay? Uh, another way to, to formulate that, or, or, or let's say another uh, similar model, would be to just take the XY model where the spins can uh, point in any direction, but then you put in this uh, perturbation that favors certain directions. You're not completely uh, locked to those directions, but those would be uh, favored directions. <clears throat> so it's, it's known and it has been known for quite a long time that, that this uh, uh, perturbation of the XY model is dangerously irrelevant. So again, what does that mean? So it means that when you go to the critical point, so in this case, uh, the critical temperature, uh, you get the same old XY universality class as, as without that term. Um, so in that sense, it's irrelevant. Uh, <clears throat> but on the other hand, it, when you go into the ordered state, you break a different symmetry. So instead of breaking the XY or U1 symmetry, uh, in this case, you break Z6 symmetry. So the, the nature of symmetry breaking is different, so that's why uh, uh, the perturbation is relevant in the ordered state. You have a different fixed point that you flow to. <clears throat> so, uh, if you think about this in terms of, of RG, uh, this, is, this is what you get. Uh, so, this is from a recent, recent paper uh, on, uh, on these clock models. Uh, so it turns out that there's still, even if this has been known for some time, there's still uh, you know, some aspects of these clock models even that are not completely uh, settled. <clears throat> anyway, so ba basically what is, is known is that, um, okay, so this perturbation, uh, when you uh, do uh, coarse graining uh, or you, you do some RG transformations, uh, the, the strength of that perturbation can change. Uh, so here, lambda is the strength of uh, so the, the, the strength of the perturbation, uh, and g would be, you know, in, in this case, just the, the temperature. <clears throat> okay. So when you uh, are close to uh, the critical point, or let's say you are at the critical point, so that's that's the x x y critical point, you just flow down to that. So this. Uh, uh, clock perturbation becomes uh, irrelevant. Lambda goes to zero. <clears throat> okay, um, but if you are, uh, by the way, this would be the inverse temperature, not the temperature. So if you are uh, at high temperatures, it also becomes irrelevant and you flow to uh, the paramagnetic fixed point. Uh, and if you are uh, below the critical temperature, then uh, initially, uh, you flow toward the cr critical point, 
<clears throat> then at some point the system realizes that it's not critical and it starts to flow toward uh, the normal you know, uh, U1 symmetry broken fixed points. It starts to flow toward this point. Uh, but then at some point uh, it, the system will uh, realize that actually it should not break U1 symmetry. It should break uh, this ZQ symmetry if you have Q states here. <clears throat> so then it actually turns away from that fixed point and it flows to another fixed point. So there are two length scales that you can in principle uh, associate with this. Um, so if you, if you think about this RG flow in terms of length scale, you can even think of it in terms of, of uh, finite system size, that you increase your uh, system size and that lowers the energy scale as well, of course. <clears throat> and then at some point, you know, when you start to deviate from, from the critical fixed point, that has to do with the correlation length of the system. So the system knows that it has a finite correlation length at some point. So you can associate this point C with the, the normal correlation length. But then for some larger length, it starts to deviate from that fixed point. So, so that, that, that defines another length scale of the system. Okay. <clears throat> so you, you can think of, of this length scale that I call uh, Xi prime here as, as this kind of crossover from uh, between those two fixed points. Um, okay, and as I write up here, uh, the correlation length, we associate that with, uh, with an exponent nu, and I will call the exponent associated with the other length scale uh, nu prime. Right. <clears throat> okay, so these RG flows, at least to me, they are often a little bit uh, abstract. You flow in, in the space of uh, coupling constants, right? But <clears throat> what, what does it actually mean? So it turns out that um, in Monte Carlo simulations, one can actually observe this in a, uh, a kind of direct way. So let me talk about uh, that a little bit. <clears throat> Okay, so now I will show some results really for, for a clock model. So the angles are really restricted to, uh, to some number of, uh, uh, of angles here. Uh, okay, so let's look at the order parameter of the system. <clears throat> so now, since these vectors live in, in uh, two dimensions, we have two components, mx and my. Um, so, so we define those as uh, sums over the whole system. So it's the average uh, over uh, the system. Um, so when I do simulations uh, for a given configuration, of course, uh, uh, the, the spins will fluctuate. So uh, I, that's why I want to average it over the whole system. <clears throat> so for each configuration, I can get a value mx and my. So uh, since I can get those mx and my point pairs, I can uh, collect the probability distribution of mx and my uh, and, and investigate it. <clears throat> so this now shows some results for uh, z, uh, so for, for q equals 8, so an 8 state instead of 6 states. Uh, okay, and these results were done uh, below the critical temperature. Uh, a bit below. So what you see here are results for these distributions for two different system sizes. Uh, the first size, L equals 4, so it's L, uh, the number of sites is just 4 cubed. Uh, so that, that's a very small system. <clears throat> but what you can see here is that these uh, average uh, uh, MX and MY, uh, their distribution basically is a circle. So what does that mean? So it means that there is order in the system, uh, but the order doesn't know about the clock angles yet. Uh, and that's because if we go to this phase diagram, we are maybe somewhere here. So that the system has ordered, um, but is, uh, is not yet 
sensitive to the clock angles. <clears throat> and the point is that, of course, the individual spins are sensitive to the clock angles. They can only uh, point in one of those directions. But the average, uh, you know, can still be, take many, many more values, right? Okay, but then when we go to the bigger system size, then you see that the distribution has developed eight distinct peaks. So now it means that uh, the average as well is starting to lock into uh, one of those, well, since if you actually would break the symmetry, you would you know, be lock, lock into one of them. But uh, here in the finite size simulation, we can still fluctuate be between those. <clears throat> OK, so this actually uh, can be used to, to quantify uh, the degree of, uh, let's say, uh, symmetry in, in these, uh, uh, these kind of histograms. So we can define something that is sensitive to this angular uh, anisotropy. So we can just take this probability distribution as a function of phi uh, and integrate it with cosine q theta. <clears throat> so that would be essentially zero here, and it would be some, some positive number here. Okay, so how can we use that to study these, these RG flows? Well, let me introduce another quantity, the so-called Binder uh, cumulant. So this is the fourth power of the order parameter mx squared plus my squared squared. <coughs> uh, and this is dividing by m squared squared, okay? So this has the property in an infinite system that uh, it's zero in the paramagnet, it's one in the ordered phase, and at the critical point, it takes some uh, universal value, which in, in this case is about 0.77. <clears throat> so if you look at, at finite size, you don't have exactly these values, but as a function of size, you flow to one of those values. So now I say flow, you know, similar to what we use in, 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 when we talk about RG flow. And indeed, we can, we can um, uh, make an, uh, a very direct analogy here. So <clears throat> I will use this bin accumulant along with this MQ. Uh, so I will look at, at the flow in that space. Uh, and this is what it looks like. <clears throat> in simulation. So here I have the bin accumulant on the x-axis and the, you know, this M6 on that axis. Uh, and what I show here is you know, flows as a function of the system size at fixed temperatures. Okay, so let's first look at, at the most uh, important point, maybe, well, maybe not in this case, but uh, the critical temperature in this case is around 2.202. Uh, uh, in that case, you see as we increase the system size, uh, uh, M6 goes down. <clears throat> so that means that the system becomes less sensitive to this discreteness of the clock angle. Uh, and then it flows, it bends a little bit, and it eventually goes to this 0.77 value. Okay. <clears throat> if I'm at, at higher temperatures, then the bin accumulant should flow to zero. Uh, and that's what it eventually will do. And now if I go below TC, you see that I flow away on the other side. Uh, and initially, I indeed flow to what seems to be going to, to this point here, uh, M6 equals 0 and uh, UM1. Uh, 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 but you see that there's some point at which this, the, the flow uh, uh, starts to reverse <clears throat> and go up. So at some point, again, the clock uh, uh, perturbation becomes more relevant, right? That's what it means when this bends over. So here again, you could defi define two length scales because now these are really system sizes here. So you could maybe define uh, the correlation length as the point at which you are closest to the critical point. That would be one def definition. And you could define the second length scale as the point where this starts to turn up. Okay, so that, that we, we are planning to do actually, this is uh, 
<coughs> actually work in progress. It's one of those works in progress that has been in progress for a couple of years already, but, <laughs> but hopefully at some point soon we will write this up. The point is that we want to you know, do this a little bit better, you know, have less fluctuations before we actually extract those, those length scales. <coughs> but I hope that makes it, it more clear what this second length scale is, or at least uh, you know, how, how you could detect it. I will mention another way to detect it a little bit later. <clears throat> so, um, now let me turn to the quantum models. So, we would like to have a model and we can study this, you know, valence bond solid state that I, I mentioned to you. So then, uh, let me introduce the, the singlet projector operator. So this operator, uh, you know, where i and j refers to two different spins, uh, this projects out uh, a singlet on those two sides. <clears throat> and that's basically what the Heisenberg interaction is. So the, the negative of this is the Heisenberg uh, exchange interaction. Uh, but now we can also form products of these singlet projectors and consider those as uh, couplings in an extended kind of Heisenberg model. And we can do that in, in different ways. So for example, we could take products of two singlet projectors arranged in this way, <coughs> or three of them arranged that way, and so on. We could do many different things. Uh, but here we want to maintain uh, the full symmetries of the square lattice. So whatever we do, we want to sum it over all translations and all rotations uh, of this kind of, uh, of uh, uh, picture here. So uh, this is what we call the JQ model. So we combine the Heisenberg exchange, this one, uh, with this kind of interaction. This is the, that one here. It's the simplest case. Uh, and it turns out that this one, when, when this Q coupling is much larger than the J coupling, that leads to a valence bond solid state. Okay, and the purpose of this model is not really to uh, model some material, but it's really uh, what we call a designer Hamiltonian to be able to study valence bond physics and, uh, uh, and this phase transition, okay? Uh, so why, why uh, do we need a model like this for that? Well, it turns out that <coughs> you can find valence bond solid states in, in many models, but it's, it had not been easy to study them with quantum Monte Carlo calculations because of what's called the sign problem. So uh, the kind of frustrated interactions that people had considered previously, they would not be amenable to, to Monte Carlo simulations. So instead one had to use some other methods and nothing really work, worked that well. <clears throat> so this provides us a, a way to, to test this deconfined uh, corner criticality scenario because we can go between the NEL state and the VBS state. So let me <clears throat> just show some quick results uh, uh, first for some, some evidence that we really have a, a, a phase transition here. So to characterize the NEL state, we can use uh, what's called the sublattice magnetization. So it's just the sum over all spins uh, uh, with this uh, antiferromagnetic phase factor. And uh, then we can also construct a simple order parameter for uh, this dimerized phase. <coughs> and now these dimers, they can form, uh, they, they form by spontaneous symmetry breaking, right? So they can form horizontally or vertically. So we have dx and dy order parameters for, for those patterns. <coughs> and um, so, so this S dot S will just measure the strength of, uh, you can say, density of singlets or something like that uh, on, on each bond. Um, so this kind of state would have a large dx and a small dy, and if you turn it around, it's, it's the other way around. <coughs> okay, and in simulations, we normally comp compute squared order parameters, so that's what I will show you. Uh, and now I show you some results as a function of system size. Uh, and you can see that if I choose the coupling ratio in a certain way, it appears that I get power law scaling 
of both all the parameters at the same time. <clears throat> and if I go away from that point, then one of them will, will turn up or, or let's say flatten out, which uh, indicates in this case that there's a dimer order. And at the same time, this m squared, the, the spin order, will turn down. So it starts to get uh, show short range correlations only. <clears throat> OK, so uh, from this one can also extract some critical exponents. Uh, and it looks like these slopes are actually very similar here. Uh, and then that makes you, uh, you know, wonder, are they really similar and what would that, would that mean? <clears throat> so that may actually mean that there is uh, uh, actually an, a higher symmetry at, uh, uh, at this critical point. And that was not predicted by this, by this deconfined criticality theory, but people are considering such uh, maybe even more exotic theories now. Um, so there, there's a, a paper by John Chalker and, and collaborators on that uh, a couple of years ago. But I will not talk more about that here. <clears throat> well, another thing is that it's not actually, so th this looks quite convincing that, you know, there's power law scaling and so on. Uh, but if one really looks carefully at things, uh, one, one should also look at, uh, you know, corrections to scaling and uh, if, if this really is, is stable as a function of system size and so on. Uh, so I will show a few more uh, results uh, in a bit on uh, critical exponents, but <clears throat> the main purpose of this talk eventually will be uh, to, to study two length scales uh, also in this system, which uh, in a similar way as those clock models uh, should happen in this system if indeed, as had been suggested, these topological defects are dangerously irrelevant. <clears throat> okay, so in, um, uh, in, in uh, uh, this case as well, if we um, look at the valence bond solid phase, uh, the, the VBS order itself actually uh, corresponds to a condensation of topological defects. Uh, so, you know, in principle, in the theory, we could have a columnar VBS or we could actually have a, a plaquette VBS where you, you can think of, of uh, a plaquette as actually resonating uh, valence bond pairs. <clears throat> the theory doesn't really uh, tell us which one we should have, both would be okay. So, we want to see in the JQ model which, which kind of uh, solid we actually have. And then we want to go towards the critical point and see how, uh, what kind of fluctuations we have in, in these valence bond patterns. So here I just show uh, the kind of histogram you would expect for dx and dy <clears throat> in a way similar to what I showed you for uh, the clock model before. So in this case, we can have, four, let's look at the columnar one. We can have, you know, four different patterns. This one and the one where we just shift up by one step, or we can uh, rotate by 90 degrees. So those four cases correspond to these four dots in, 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 uh, in the, uh, the histogram. <clears throat> now, if we have a plaquette, since uh, you know, the plaquettes correspond to uh, X and Y bond pairs fluctuating, we actually have both X and Y order at the same time. So in that case, we would have four points, but rotated by uh, 45 degrees from that one. <clears throat> so we can now look at, uh, at, at these distributions in simulations uh, as well. Um, and I will show you uh, some histograms in a moment, but let's look at what we would expect from, uh, uh, from, uh, from RG. This is actually not an actual RG calculation. It's some kind of imagined uh, RG calculation by Matthew Fisher. <clears throat> uh, I just took it from, from some talk that he has given. Uh, so this would correspond to the fugacity of topological defects. Uh, and these would be, uh, uh, you know, varying the, some coupling constant that lets you go between the antiferromagnet and uh, if we didn't have any 
uh, topological defects, we would be able to flow to a U1 spin liquid. <clears throat> but because of the condensation of topological defects in the VBS, that would be again something that turns us away from, from that, uh, that uh, fixed point to another fixed point. So in this case, we have also the antiferromagnetic order instead of in the clock model where this was just the, the, the paramagnetic phase. Okay, so, but it's very similar to, to the clock model. That's the proposal. <clears throat> um, right, so uh, this is what we want to, to basically try to test now. So as I mentioned here, you know, this is the kind of uh, probability distributions you may expect if you have those kinds of, uh, of, of phases. <clears throat> and this is what, what we actually see. This is in, in what we call the JQ3 model, which has three singlet projectors in the Q term. So this is now <clears throat> for a fixed system size at, at a point uh, close to the critical point, but still inside the VBS phase. So you can see that we have formed a ring here. So that means that the order parameter has formed some amplitude, but it doesn't seem to show any, any of these four points that we may have expected. <clears throat> if we go further, you know, deeper down in the VBS phase, then we start to see four blobs that indicate, uh, you know, uh, a columnar uh, VBS pattern. But the point is that, again, we see something where uh, we, we have order, but it's not uh, the kind of order that we would naively expect. It, it, it has a, a higher symmetry than the VBS uh, eventually would have. <clears throat> so that's the first indication that actually there is this emergent U1 symmetry uh, and caused by a dangerously uh, irrelevant perturbation. So now let's look at, at these RG uh, flows that we did for the clock model. <clears throat> so again, I can use bind accumulants as, as, uh, uh, for my x-axis, and I can use uh, uh, this, this kind of uh, uh, angular sensitive uh, order parameter on the y-axis. <clears throat> so you see, I, what we get here is something quite similar to the clock model. So if we sit at the critical point or very close to it, we, okay, the, the, the curve has some sort of shape here, but still we eventually converge with increasing system size to some point here. So here, by the way, we have two ordered phases, so I can uh, plot the difference in the bind accumulant of the two, two phases. So if this goes to a negative value, it means that I'm flowing to the antiferromagnetic phase, uh, and if it's positive, it it's, uh, uh, means I'm on the VBS side. So you see that if I'm, if if my coupling ratio is is less than the critical value, then indeed I start to flow to minus one there, and this D4 is is always extremely close to zero. Um, while if I'm on the VBS side, again, it looks like initially I flow to this point here, and that would be the U1 spin liquid. But in fact, for some system size, this turns up, and I flow away from that fixed point. So again, we could define two length scales from this, but we haven't done it yet. <clears throat> OK, so, if we, so this was to illustrate that we really have two length scales, and we have emergent U1 symmetry. So this is an indicator that we really have two divergent length scales. <clears throat> now let's talk about finite size scaling. Uh, if we want to, for example, extract uh, exponents, uh, what, 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 what should we do? <clears throat> so we work with finite size, but in the end we want to relate everything to what goes on in the thermodynamic limit. So if we look at, um, for example, a classical transition with just one divergent length, or it could be a quantum transition as well. Uh, so this delta would just mean the distance from the critical point, whether it's a, a thermal or a quantum critical point. 
Okay, and, and this would be the correlation length in the thermodynamic limit. <clears throat> so if we have some other singular, singular quantity like a susceptibility or uh, specific heat, whatever, uh, that would also have some power law behavior. Uh, and that can always be related to the correlation length. We can just express uh, delta in terms of the correlation length, and then we get an expression like that. <clears throat> so now to uh, study the size dependence at the critical point, we can just say, okay, uh, the correlation length can only go up to L, so the value of this quantity A at the critical point we just get by replacing the correlation length by L here. And then we get L to minus kappa over nu. <clears throat> so kappa would just be the exponent that uh, governs this particular quantity. Okay, and uh, one can go beyond that and say, okay, if we are away from the critical point, uh, let me not really talk about the motivation, but what, what one expects in finite size scaling is that that L factor gets multiplied by eventually a function of the distance to the critical point times L to 1 over nu, where nu again is the correlation length exponent. <clears throat> so that one can, can test. So here I show some results uh, for a simple 2D icing model. Uh, and I show the susceptibility for different system sizes. And you see that there's a peak which eventually will go to, uh, to the critical point. <clears throat> so now what we can do is to rescale the data uh, using this kind of form. So what I did here was divided out the expected size dependence by multiplying by L to that power. Uh, and then I graph the results as a function of, of this argument here. So T here is, is the same as, as delta. <clears throat> and this I could do easily here because we know what the exponents are in the icing model and we also know uh, the critical temperature so I can define this T as just T minus Tc. So you see that this, this works uh, quite well. If the systems are big enough then uh, we get this uh, common curve which then is that scaling function F. <clears throat> Okay, and if we don't know the critical temperature and we don't know the exponents, then we can uh, just do some fitting procedure and try to get the base, best data collapse possible, and that will give us uh, what we are looking for. <clears throat> but let's look at how one can do that more, more systematically. So the data collapse sometimes is not a very systematic way to do it. So let's look at this, this bind accumulant again. So here are some results for the bind accumulant. Uh, so as I mentioned already, it should be one in the ordered phase and zero in the disordered phase. <clears throat> and then it's always rounded by finite size. Uh, but the nice thing is, as I also mentioned already, uh, that it takes some specific value between zero and one at the critical point. So that means that these curves will actually cross each other uh, at some point, and those crossing points will uh, drift very fast towards the critical point. As you can see here, it really looks like they're crossing in, in one point, although it's not exactly one point, as we will see. <clears throat> so if we look at, at this more closely, here I just look at, you know, zoom in really close to the crossing region for three different sizes you can see that it's not really crossing in one point. But if we extract uh, the crossing point between results for sizes L and 2L, we can see how those drift as we increase the system size. Uh, and this is shown here. Uh, and you can see that that, uh, you know, that point converges to some value, and then we can actually uh, make some uh, fitting and so on, based on, on what we expect from, from, from scaling theory. <clears throat> and eventually, this is just a test that it, it works. Uh, uh, in this case, we can reproduce uh, you know, exact results uh, very nicely. So this is now what we have done also in, in the JQ model. So we have looked at uh, the bind accumulant, uh, 
<clears throat> well, I should mention before I, I, I talk about that, I should say we can also extract uh, the correlation length exponent from uh, this kind of analysis by looking at actually the slopes of, of these uh, curves when they cross each other. <clears throat> so we can look at the slopes uh, based on pairs again, uh, the, the two pairs, uh, two, two sizes that cross. Uh, and if, if we form the log of the slope ratio, it turns out that this gives us basically one of a new up to some correction. So one can test that as well for the 2D icing model. In that case, nu is known to be one, so this should go to one, and it, it does go to one, something very close to one. So this, this uh, works. <clears throat> but I should say here that the reason that this works so well here is that this exponent omega in the icing model is pretty large. It's close to two. In this case, it's something like 1.75. Well, it is exactly 1.75. Uh, so that's why this convergence is rather fast and it's easy to make the extrapolation. And that's not always the case as we will see now. <clears throat> so in the JQ model we have also done this using a kind of uh, binder ratio. One can use the cumulant or the ratio, it doesn't really matter. So again we, we, we show, you know, do different system sizes, we extract uh, crossing points uh, from uh, sizes L and 2L, and we, we analyze those. <clears throat> and, and here are some results. So now you see that uh, the drift in, uh, in the horizontal direction here is actually non-monotonic. Uh, and that makes it a bit harder to do the calculation. For example, we really need to go to big sizes so that eventually uh, we can see the, the uh, asymptotic approach uh, to, to the critical point. Uh, in, in the correlation length exponent, thankfully we don't see any non-monotonic behaviors and uh, the fitting procedure works quite well. So again, we, we expect from scaling theory certain corrections <coughs> and we can you know, fit to those forms and um, it works quite well. So this eventually gives us what we were looking for, uh, the correlation length exponent. And it turns out to be pretty small, and it's also quite hard to extrapolate it because it turns out that this correction exponent is, is uh, pretty small, so that you see that it's, it's turning up here and it's not uh, uh, as, uh, as, as nice as it was for, uh, for the icing model where, where since omega is uh, larger than one, it, it, it flattens out like that, right? <clears throat> but nevertheless, this seems sort of, uh, at least to me, quite uh, well behaved. So, so this again supports a continuous transition instead of a first order transition that some people have proposed that it should be. Uh, if, if, if it would be a first order transition, then nu should actually be one third. It's one over uh, the dimensionality, space plus uh, time dimension. So two plus one in this case, so it should go somewhere here, which it doesn't appear to do. Okay, now let, let me see. I think I have about five, seven minutes left, right? Something like that. Ten minutes. Okay, 10 minutes, good. So then I, I have time to actually come to the uh, new things here. <clears throat> so another way actually to, uh, another way that these two length scales are manifested uh, is in domain walls. <clears throat> so, you know, if you have an ordered state and you have a, a, a finite system, you can, by boundary conditions, you can lock uh, the two sides uh, into different phases. <clears throat> and then, of course, you will have a domain wall in the middle. So it turns out that in these cases where we have two length scales, uh, like in the clock model and, and like also in this JQ model, uh, the domain wall thickness is actually given by the second length. So the domain wall thickness will be, in general, much, much larger than the correlation length. Okay, so this, maybe I forgot to, well, no, I guess, guess I said it, the second length scale is always larger, right? So, so new uh, prime is larger than new. <clears throat> so now I can analyze the free energy cost of a wall. It, it, this is a pretty simple expression. You just 
uh, think of, uh, okay, this is the, the uh, what is the gradient here, and then you know you get the gradient squared, and over this width, and then this uh, you have to multiply by by the volume, uh, total volume of uh, in the other directions. <clears throat> so this would be the, the free energy cost of, of a domain wall. Uh, so then if we uh, normalize it by dividing out the other directions, uh, you, you get, get some expression like that. <clears throat> um, now, so, so this would be maybe for some classical case. So how about the, uh, uh, the valence bond solid? Well, in the valence bond solid, you can lock the open boundaries to different uh, dimerization patterns, as I show here. So here you see that there's a shift from the left to the right here. Uh, and actually in this case, as I will explain in a moment, it turns out that you get two domain walls uh, and you get some you know, uh, horizontal bonds in the middle and there's a domain wall where the system looks like it's in the plaquette phase, like that. And this is some sort of snapshot in a simulations, of course, in reality this fluctuates and uh, the domain walls can also move. Uh, so it's not so easy to really analyze the domain walls by, uh, by, by looking directly at them. <clears throat> so that's why we actually instead want to look at uh, uh, the energy cost uh, of a domain wall. That's not sensitive to, to any sort of averaging when the domain walls fluctuate. <clears throat> so one can go through a similar argument and that was also done in a paper by Sentil et al. in a slightly different way. So in this case, uh, due to the fact that the dynamic exponent is one and things like that, uh, the energy cost of the domain wall should scale with these two length scales in this simple way. Okay, and that's what we want to test now, because this would be a, a quite a direct test of, of the second length scale. <clears throat> so let, let me show you what we get in the clock model first, if we uh, try to calculate this uh, domain wall energy kappa. Okay, so it turns out, let me not talk about the technicalities, but we can do that in simulations. Uh, and now we have this expression that we, what, what, what's the expectation uh, as we go toward the critical point, uh, this domain wall should cost less and less energy and that's the expression. <clears throat> but now we're dealing with finite size. Uh, so then the question is, since we have two length scales, we have two uh, Xi and Xi prime, which one or perhaps both should we replace by the system size when we go to finite size scaling? So in the normal case with one exponent, as I mentioned, or, or, yeah, we, we should just replace the correlation length by L, then we get the scaling immediately. And in fact, in this case, it looks like we should replace both by L. So if we replace both by L, the prediction is kappa goes like L to the minus two. <clears throat> so this is what we get uh, for, uh, as a function of one over the system size. On log scales, you see basically it looks like a power law. And if we extract uh, a sort of floating exponent from pairs of points, uh, we get something that extrapolates quite well to two. So it, it looks like in, in, in this case, uh, finite size scaling is obtained by replacing both lengths by L. Okay, now let's look at the JQ model. <clears throat> so the JQ model, we actually, as I mentioned already, we could get two domain walls uh, at the same time. And that was because what I did in the previous graph was not, uh, which is reproduced here. Uh, I put one boundary like that and one boundary like that, that corresponds to this situation here. So it looks like, okay, we could have a domain wall in between there. But actually what will happen is that this domain wall will split up into two domain walls of this type. So these are the actual, uh, you know, lo lowest energy uh, domain walls of the system. <clears throat> so we can actually do the calculation with, with, in both cases. In this case, we will have get the energy cost of one domain wall. If we do it in that way, which is what we did here, we get the energy cost of two domain walls. And this was the expectation in the thermodynamic limit. Okay, now let's see what we get. <clears throat> so these two, well, so first let's look at the inset actually. So this is again the, uh, the cost per wall uh, as a function of one over L. 
so I have normalized it here, so you see we, they, they become essentially the same. Uh, and there's some slope, and we can extract uh, a local slope from pairs uh, of points. Uh, and you know, from this kind of wall and that kind of wall, we call them pi walls and pi over two walls. Uh, we get two different curves as a function of the inverse system size, but they do scale, thankfully, to, to the same point. <clears throat> but that point is not two. So if we just replace you know, both length scales by L here, we will again say, okay, it should go like L to the minus two. But it's not always clear that we actually should replace both length scales by L. So you could, in principle, imagine you know, three different scenarios. Maybe you should, okay, the middle one is, is the one we just had, but you could also say, well, maybe we should let Xi go to L, but Xi prime go to L to the new prime of a new, which would be you know, what Xi prime is when Xi is L, if, if we say that uh, they are related you know, by this exponent ratio. <clears throat> the third scenario is that it's Xi prime that should be replaced by L, and then Xi should be L to the new of a new prime. Okay, so this is what, what that would um, imply in the different cases. And now, since we get a value less than two, it's only consistent with the third scenario there. <clears throat> so it seems like we have some anomalous behavior here, which is not there in the clock model. Uh, and if that's indeed true, then this also gives us access to this exponent ratio. So if we assume that that's the case, then now we know nu of a new prime. Uh, right. So in this sense, this seems to be different from you know, this standard dangerously irrelevant perturbation because the finite size effects are different. So um, if we look at normal finite size scaling, you know, uh, th this may also have, have some uh, other uh, consequences. So we already talked about finite size scaling, you know, where we had one length. So what we are proposing now is that, okay, let's put both lengths into the scaling uh, function, but then we, actually, then we actually have one scenario that eventually, if we want to reproduce the thermodynamic limit, so we assume that we have the standard thermodynamic limit, uh, we can get a conventional kind of behavior. Uh, but we can also, depending on which of these two arguments controls the behavior when L goes to infinity, we can get you know, different uh, pre-factors uh, in terms of size scaling. <clears throat> so one important quantity that we have looked at is the spin stiffness, which is like an elasticity constant of the magnetic system. In that case, it turns out that in the thermodynamic limit, this is the exponent, kappa is nu times z plus d minus 2, and in this case, z is 1, d is, uh, is 2, so this is just uh, uh, nu. <clears throat> um, but let me keep it in this form. So this would, uh, first scenario here would predict that the stiffness should scale in that way, whereas the new scenario predicts that it should scale in that way. <clears throat> and so far, when people have analyzed data for the JQ and other models, we have always assumed this first scenario, uh, because that would be you know, the conventional uh, power of L here. So even if nobody had proposed this kind of form, everybody just assumed, oh, this stiffness should scale as it always does. But it turns out that the stiffness and also other quantities <coughs> have always ha ha shown some anomalous behavior. So in the conventional scenario, rho s times l, because of the values of, of z and d, should just go to a constant when l goes to infinity. But it doesn't go to a constant. It seems to diverge. And some people have interpreted that as, as, as a sign that the transition is really first order. But now what we are saying is that it's actually because uh, the exponent should actually be modified. And we can actually fit the behavior. Uh, and now the nice thing is that we know new of a new prime from this domain wall calculation. So we, now we can really test that and actually it, it seems to work uh, quite well. <clears throat> so that, that's basically the story. So we believe that these two length scales actually have some more dramatic consequences in this system than, uh, 
uh, people had uh, realized before. Um, uh, and we would like to do a lot of further tests, and in fact we are doing some more tests of, of the consistency of, of these two uh, uh, scaling behaviors, the domain wall energy and, and the spin stiffness and other quantities. It turns out that one can also uh, uh, you know, try to do the scaling in a slightly different way to, to uh, 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 let's say, get rid of corrections, and that's what we are doing now. I think I should uh, not get into details here, but the point is that we have a, an even better confirmation of <coughs> the, the scaling than before. So these lines are basically predicted again by this domain wall uh, new over new prime uh, uh, exponent ratio that we got. And these are some results for these quantities. And, and we are now changing just uh, basically how we scale the uh, temperature with the system size when we study criticality. Uh, and we can, can uh, see that there's some optimal way of doing that where the, the, the scaling behavior has, has the least corrections to scaling. <clears throat> okay, let me just quickly say without going into details that a really nice thing here is that uh, in quantum criti criticality, temperature scaling is also a kind of finite size scaling because when you go to the path integral, imaginary time is basically the size, uh, or so, yeah, sorry, I should say the temperature goes into uh, the size of the system in the imaginary time dimension. So. It seems like this kind of scaling behavior that we are finding in finite size also applies to uh, finite temperature scaling. So some of the scaling behaviors that people have believed that are universal and always true, actually we believe are again modified by, by this exponent ratio nu over nu prime. <clears throat> so that may, may be a more important result because of course experimentally you, you look at temperature behavior more than you know, finite size behavior. Okay, so I think I'm out of time, so I will just put up my conclusions here and uh, I can take your questions. Thank you. Right. Yeah. yeah, you know, that's, not, that's uh, you know, not a stupid question at all, of course. It's the, uh, really a key question, right? <clears throat> so we, we don't know, right? So, you know, you c could imagine that uh, some many strongly correlated systems could have something like these dangerously relevant operators, but we really don't know any ex other examples. We are actually trying to see if one could uh, uh, make some model which is even simpler than the JQ model, you know, that may have this. But actually, I sort of suspect that the JQ model is the simplest uh, model. So, you know, in classical physics, we, we have clock models and, and you, know, uh, you know, spin systems in crystal fields and things like that. Th that's also dangerously relevant uh, perturbations. So that's quite common in classically. But in the classical case, we didn't really seem to see this really anomalous impact on, 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 uh, on other quantities. So it, it would, of course, be nice to know in, in quantum systems if, if this happens in some other settings as well. Yeah, so you know, th this works no matter what the value of H is, right? So of course, if H is very large, you know, here, this becomes the clock model. Right. And, and we see it in the clock model too. So, you know, uh, I guess if we, uh, you know, look at, at our results here, <coughs> if we do something similar, you know, with, with the actual field there, the field is weaker, I, I guess that we will get closer to the critical point before we actually turn back up because the perturbation is weaker, right? But we, ha we haven't done, it that, done that, but I guess that's what would be expected. 
Right. Uh, it oh, goes it goes like T. Oh, sorry, it goes like T. Yeah. Uh, how does the exponent change? Yeah, yeah, so, so, yeah, exactly. So, so I went very fast there, so sorry about that. Uh, right, so, so normally, okay, here I wrote it with the generic exponents, but in, in this case, d over z minus 1 is just 1. So, so the normal behavior is just t. And now, you know, what we are, this is sort of conjecture because we actually have not really been able to derive this. But, you know, based on what we see in the results, uh, we, we can fit it if we just multiply that exponent with new uh, of a new prime as well. It works essentially perfectly. Yeah, so this is what we extracted. So this is not a fitted value, it's taken from the domain wall calculation. So in that sense, you know, what we are doing is, is uh, self, very self-consistent, right? We do one calculation and then a completely different calculation and, and the, uh, it's consistent. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that this O5 like thing, so. Yeah. I think there was a typo there actually. It should be S05. Uh, I, I noticed it uh, when I gave mm -hmm. one of my lectures to you, but yeah, so sorry, yeah, O5, uh, S05, yeah. Uh, so y you think you can, one can produce similar maps to show the flow of the, uh, like, like your RG flows, Monte Carlo <coughs> RG flows? Using yeah, yeah other right. Or? You know, actually, so you know, there may be uh, even here something which is already. Uh, also uh, hinting at that, because what we what we do in in this plot here is here, I take the difference of the bin accumulants. So in principle, there is no reason why at the critical point the dimer bin accumulant should be the same as the nil order bin accumulant. But you see, the difference is uh, you know to be in our precision, it, it's actually zero. So that means that the bin accumulants are exactly the same. Uh, and I would guess that, you know, should also be a consequence of SO5 symmetry. So the way one can test it is also, is, which we haven't done, but it was done in this paper by John Chalker at all in a slightly different model. Uh, one can look at histograms of, uh, you know, both the uh, VBS order and the magnetic orders. So, you know, the magnetic order is O3 and the VBS order you know, becomes U1 symmetric, so you have a basically a five-dimensional vector and you can make some cuts and make histograms uh, in that space. And they found that those are very uh, you know, symmetric. <laughs> but we, we haven't done any, anything more on that, but we, we, we should perhaps do that. Right. Well, the two length scales are this. I think the, that cannot be excluded because you could still have an, you know, SO5 critical point with a dangerously irrelevant perturbation. So I think it should be okay still. But what, what is not completely clear is, um, or it could be clear to the field theorists that are working on this, but to me it's not. I mean, is the theory now different from the CP1 uh, model that they uh, proposed initially or not. So th there was actually even several years ago by Sentil and Fisher, they already had actually a, a different formulation uh, which they said was the same as the CP1 model in the SU2 case, but only for SU2. And actually the proposal now also is that if there is this SO5 symmetry, that should probably only happen for SU2. One can also actually extend these JQ models to higher n. We have already done SU3, SU4, and we have done slightly different models up to SU10. And it, things fit quite well with the field theory predictions, actually, for, you know, there's some 1 over n expansions and so on of, of exponents, and they seem to fit quite well. Mm-hmm.